Good afternoon. Um, welcome to this webinar on our consultation on the regulation of Silex lawyers by the SRA, or I should say potential regulation. And I thought a good place to start would be how have we got here, not personally how I've got here, but what, why are we consulting on potentially regulating Silex lawyers? Well, a reminder of the background, um, last year Silex approached us to ask about the possibility of redelegating regulation of their members from Silex regulation to us. Now we were open to discussions about that, but the ball was very much um, in Silex's court on that one. Um, if we move on to this year, Silex's board decided it did want to um, sort of pursue those plans, explore those plans, and Silex launched a consultation on their proposals in August. And I'm pleased um, that one of our speakers today is uh, Linda Ford, Silex's CEO, as we thought it'd be important um, to hear from Silex to set out their reasoning about why they want to go ahead with this. Following um, Silex's consultation, um, we at the SRA launched a separate consultation on these proposals from the SRA's perspective, particularly looking at, well, what practically would it mean if these plans went ahead? What would it mean for how we regulate? And that covers everything from enforcement to authorization to qualification. And that is very much um, what we will be focusing on today, the content of that consultation, which is open until the 22nd of November and details of that consultation are below this webinar. And I'm delighted that we're joined um, by a few people from the SRA to discuss that. We've got Juliet Oliver, our General Counsel and Deputy um, Chief um, um, Executive. We've also got Tony Stafford, um, our policy manager, who both worked very closely on these proposals. And we also have Paul Phillip, um, our chief executive, who may um, come in um, in the question and answer um, session on this as well. And as I said, the core of this webinar is we're going to be focusing on the SRA consultation. Um, hopefully this will help you in responding um, to our proposals, whether you're a solicitor, a Silex lawyer, a member of the public or someone else who's interested. We'd be really keen to hear what you think. Hopefully you find this webinar useful. But actually, if you've got questions that you're not sure about the answer um, to or we haven't covered, you can ask questions of us. There's a link below, click on that link. You can submit questions anonymously. It's nice to know who you are, but you can do it anonymously. And we'll try to get through as many of those questions as we can at the end of this webinar. But before we jump into the practical details um, of how we might regulate Silex um, lawyers, um, I wanted to sort of start with what's the case for change? What's the argument about why this might be a good thing? And perhaps I could go over to you first, Linda, to talk us through um, what, why you think it's a good idea. Great. Yeah, thanks very much, Ben. So um, Silex started this process really by undertaking a, a review of its regulation as part of its responsibilities as the approved regulator of, of Silex members. And, and, and that status of Silex is not proposed to change. But what we are looking at is who we delegate the discharge of regulation to. For us, the SRA was an obvious choice partly because 75% of Silex members are already within the scope of SRA regulation. They work in SRA regulated firms or they're working under the supervision of solicitors already. The SRA is also the largest of the other legal regulators. It's got the highest profile and it's the only other legal regulator who already regulates practitioners with the same scope of specialisms that the um, Silex lawyers practice under. So for us, it was an obvious choice to um, approach the SRA and ask for proposals as to how the SRA would regulate our members. As you say, we've got our own consultation running that runs until the, the 5th of November, um, and that's really based on the case for change, the reasons why we, we think we might want to change our delegation. And that's really about establishing consistency of standards and of consumer redress and protection for all those being serviced by Silex lawyers alongside solicitors. It's about creating a simplified model of, of regulation. It's a, a complex regulatory landscape. There are lots of players in the, the regulation market in legal services. And actually, this is confusing for consumers. So we'd like to see something that's simpler, enables consumer understanding and has an easier navigation, less regulators to deal with and less complexity where you've got two regulators who may have jurisdiction over the same practitioners. 
And also thinking about the other regulatory objectives, in particular things like competition in the marketplace, making sure that there continues to be a diversity of both entities and practitioners. And the proposals that we've received from the SRA cover all of those points and are going to be subject to, um, to the discussions that we have today. I think the key points from Silex's perspective is that we do expect that there's an ability to maintain the distinct identity of Silex professionals within this regulatory model and also preserving the distinct Silex route into the law as well. And there's no expectation from us that there would be a cross subsidy of cost and funding between the different professions if the SRA were to regulate both. So they're sort of founding principles for Silex in, in considering this change of delegation. Thank you, um, Linda. Perhaps, um, Juliet, we could go over to you now to go, how does it look from the SRA's perspective in terms of the sort of case for change here? Um, thanks, Ben. Yes. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, we were asked by Silex to look at this, um, uh, look at uh, taking on the delegated role. And we were happy that we could respond positively and deliver a proposal to regulate Silex members and firms. And we think there's a good case for doing so, particularly, as Linda said, um, 75% of Silex members work already in SRA regulated firms. Um, from our perspective, we're looking at things through a regulatory lens um, and you know, looking at the governing principles of good regulation and the objectives set out for us in the Legal Services Act. You're going to hear me reflect quite a lot of what Len Linda has said about um, those regulatory objectives, because as we explained in our consultation, we can see five key um, benefits um, from our taking over the regulation of Silex members and firms. Firstly, in terms of public confidence, by simplifying the regulatory landscape. The picture at the moment is pretty complex and fragmented, with different lawyers working side by side, regulated by different bodies. So there's an element there of simplification, clarity and transparency around the ar arrangements. Also in reducing regulatory overlap, which again causes confusion, but also increases the regulatory costs and burden for the system as a whole. Um, as, as we've said, around 75% of Silex members work in SRA firms, so we're already held to our standards of conduct, but are also subject to um, parallel, parallel regulatory regime for effectively the same matters. Thirdly, um, improving public protection. By ensuring greater consistency of standards, and enforcement processes and outcomes for two key groups of lawyers. And also because people using Silex firms would benefit from better client protection arrangements than they have now. And I know we're going to go into a little um, bit of the detail around that uh, later on in the webinar. And um, finally, um, it would make it easier to deal with emerging regulatory issues in an integrated way across both professions. We think this allows us to be more agile and again, consistent, when addressing novel issues or risks to the sector, if one body, the SRA, works across both professions. Thank you, Julia. And I think it's, again, probably worth re-emphasising re the point that um, they're two very separate consultations. And um, we're certainly not prejudging the outcomes of those consultations. And of course, if Silex um, decides following consultation that it doesn't want to go ahead with re-delegation, then very much the SRA proposals will um, fall away. But let's move on to looking at some of the detail of those proposals. I know it's, it's quite a long consultation. There's lots in there. Um, but Julia, coming to you, um, you've got a slide up there. What, could you just want to talk us through some of the key issues that you think are relevant for people to focus on? Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate there's a lot of material in there. Um, it is a big consultation because we're seeking views on all of the key changes we'd need to make to our regulatory arrangements. And that includes the draft rules and um, and, and sort of detailed um, impact assessments as well. But I think there are three key areas um, where we're making detailed proposals, which I would want to draw out. And I know we're going to touch on in more detail in, in the webinar. Um, and those are firstly um, regulatory standards. So the standards we would set for Silex members. We um, propose that authorised Silex lawyers should continue to be regulated under a separate code of conduct, but one that reflects many of the key standards which apply to solicitors, so that there's a, a kind of greater alignment there. And we're consulting on a draft of that, um, and um, I can go into a bit more detail on that in a moment. Um, secondly, education and authorisation. Um, we're proposing to maintain a clear, distinct route to becoming an authorised legal professional for Silex members. Um, and this will initially mirror the current Silex regulation model, and it will recognise the role Silex holds in developing and delivering the relevant um, educational qualifications. 
And thirdly, enforcement. We would have a full suite of powers, which broadly reflect those that Silex regulation have now. Um, these would sit alongside the powers that we have already for those working within SRA firms. Um, and in those circumstances, we would be able to enforce those powers directly, choosing the most suitable sanction for any given situation without that duplication, that parallel regime that I talked about earlier. So those are the, the, the main points. I'm sure we're going to touch on some other areas um, uh, uh, later on, including our proposals on consumer protection, which I, I mentioned earlier and, and I'm sure we'll touch on later. Yeah, so well, let, well, let's look at the first one of those then. Um, and Tony, perhaps I'll come to you on this one. And that is the regulatory standards and in particular regulatory standards for individuals. Um, how will that work? And is it right that they'll only apply to some Silex members? Thanks, Ben. Yeah, the focus of the consultation is on those individual Silex members who are authorised to carry out reserve legal services or immigration work. So that's primarily the people who who are um, chartered legal executives or Silex practitioners. And I should note that um, part of the current Silex consultation is about changes to some of their membership titles. But in our proposals, we're using the current terms for now. And for regulatory purposes, um, we're calling those people um, authorised Silex lawyers. And we're using that term to also cover people who are authorised at the moment by Silex regulation as ACCA probate practitioners and also as the associate prosecutors in the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, and I should highlight at this point that um, people who are already authorised in any of those roles by Silex regulation wouldn't have to reapply to us to, um, to be reauthorised. We would do that automatically. Now, in terms of the other Silex members, the students and paralegals who are in the sort of bottom right hand box on this slide, um, as you've already heard, 75% of those already work in SRA firms and many others are working under the supervision of a solicitor. So they are already within the scope of SRA regulation. Um, and Silex is currently consulting as part of its package of proposals on changes to its membership structure for paralegals and students. So we've said that once the outcome of that consultation is known, um, we'll work with Silex to agree how the remaining people who aren't currently in the scope of SRA regulation, around 25% of, of Silex paralegals, will continue to be regulated in future. And perhaps I could come to you then, Linda, on that paralegals point. But what, what is your your sort of view and approach on that? Did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, part of the current Silex consultation is a proposal around establishing a national register of paralegals. And that will be a public facing searchable register register um, with the intention of allowing um, the public and allowing employers to identify those paralegals who have been assessed by Silex of having met the relevant standards and who are subject to regulations so that they can have confidence in in those professionals. There's also a proposal to add a new status of chartered paralegal into our structure um, and the idea being that that offers a career progression step and a status for paralegals who are not looking to go on and qualify um, uh, through the, the qualified lawyer pathway but are enjoying um, a, an experienced career as a paralegal. So once the outcomes of our consultation are known as to whether we're going to move ahead with those proposals, we'll be in a much stronger position to be able to identify um, the regulatory requirements for, for those on that professional paralegal register that are in that 25% that we've talked about that aren't already covered within the scope of, of SRA regulation. There's also an, a CMA review, a Competition Marketing Authority review uh, on the cards as well for legal services, and that's looking at some of the areas of, of unregulated service, and that may well have a, an impact on the requirements for paralegals as well. So we'll be looking at that as to whether there are any relevant issues that we need to take into account when deciding what the, the ultimate regulatory framework needs to look like. Thank you, Linda. And some of you may notice that the lights have just literally gone out in this room because they're motion activated. They hopefully haven't metaphorically gone out. So if you see me moving manically, it will be to get them to turn back on. So ignore me if you see that's the case. But let's, to, let's turn to the code of um, conduct, conduct and I suppose the a sep I think it's proposed there's a separate code of conduct that's been, been proposed for authorised Silex members. Um, what's the deal there, Juliet? Yes, that's right. Um, as I said earlier, we've included a draft of the code in the consultation document. Um, it's relatively short. I'd recommend anyone interested has a read of it. Um, 
what we're proposing to do is, um, as I said before, uh, regulate authorised Silex lawyers and solicitors to similar professional standards. The principles we've set out are effectively the same as the core principles in the current um, code for all Silex members. So all Silex members will work under the same high level professional principles, whether they're authorised by us or not. Um, and we think that will help to support consistency and ca career progression within the membership. But it's worth noting that there's already a high degree of alignment between these um, principles and the existing principles for solicitors and SRA firms. Um, in terms of the rest of the code, again, there are already existing synergies, um, but um, the draft um, that we're consulting on sort of it aligns further the requirements for authorised Silex um, lawyers with those for solicitors. So, for example, um, the rules on reporting misconduct um, and the rules on duties to the court. There are two areas where um, the standards are very high level in the existing Silex arrangements and ours are more detailed. They give essentially just more flesh to the bone on what is required. Um, and so the new draft includes that level of detail. Um, also, there are no existing Silex standards on um, client identification, um, details around publicity, um, areas where there are obligations in the, in the solicitor's code and which we've um, put also into, the, into our draft code to match those. Um, and of course, the rest of our standards and the regulations will apply um, where relevant too. So, for example, our price and services um, transparency rules apply to all firms we regulate, so they apply to, 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 to Silex um, firms too. Um, and um, they apply across a, a wider set of areas of law um, and will have a wider scope, um, we believe, than currently in the Silex firm population. Um, there are some differences, though, from the Code for Solicitors, and these are really to reflect um, Silex members' different scope of practice. So, for instance, the Code says um, that Silex lawyers must not act in matters where they don't have rights or authorisation um, and must make their authorised status clear um, and mustn't hold out an undertaking to be a solicitor's undertaking. Those reflect um, standards that are in the, in, in, the, um, in the current Silex Code, but there's some quite context specific differences there so so we've maintained those differences. Now Julia I do keep an eye on the legal press and there have been some um, concerns raised that these proposed arrangements for individual Silex members could um, sort of suggest the false equivalence between um, you know different groups of professionals uh, and there's a risk that that could um, create confusion particularly for consumers. Uh, what's your view on that? Yes, I think what I would say is that the current situation risk consume, uh, risks, risks confusion. Um, as I mentioned before, the current regulatory landscape is pretty complex um, and it's quite difficult for consumers to navigate at the moment. Um, we're not starting from a, from a blank sheet of paper. Um, also, I'd say that um, the legal framework um, gives Silex lawyers the same practicing rights as solicitors in the reserved areas of law in which they're authorised. Um, so that's an important point, I think, just, 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 just to make in that respect. Our proposals would maintain distinct and separate identities for solicitors and for authorised Silex lawyers. And, and, and we've talked a little bit about that and, 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 and Linda has as well. Um, what we think we would be able to do is to publish information about um, both professions in a way that makes clear the ways in which um, authorisation and practice rights differ. We think this would um, reduce rather than create con uh, confusion for consumers um, and, and, and create opportunities for us to bring um, clarity and transparency in the information and the explanations we can give around the, 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 the registers. Um, we've also said, as I've just, as I've just described, that we're, we're going to aim to, to regulate solicitors and author authorised Silex lawyers to similar high professional standards in the relevant areas of law in which they practice. Um, so as well as the opportunity to improve understanding through easily accessible information. We'll also um, remove unnecessary complication and duplication, conflicts or inconsistencies in regulatory processes and standards. So again, taken together, we actually think this would reduce rather than create confusion for consumers. Thank you. And let's move on to one of the questions actually we've had um, um, submitted by today's audience. So thank you um, for the person who submitted this. And they've asked about how would the SRA deal with people who are dual qualified as both a solicitor and a Silex lawyer? Uh, Juliet, would that be one for you? Yeah, shall I jump in there? So, um, 
I mean, a person would still be entitled to hold both professional titles. You can be authorised or registered with with both sets of qualifications. Um, so, 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 so no change there. I think the alignment of the principles and codes will mean that there'll be less opportunity for conflict or duplication from a regulatory point of view in in you in your holding both roles. So, um, the standards that apply will be in most material terms the same. In terms of the practice to which they apply or uh, what we're going to point to if we need to enforce any wrongdoing or anything like that. I mean, that will depend on what hat or hats um, you're wearing. Um, but again, there'd be no parallel proceedings anymore. Um, it's worth mentioning um, that in terms of you know what hat you're wearing, effectively, um, you're likely to be wearing a solicitor's hat, even if you're also wearing a Silex um, lawyer hat, because under the Solicitors Act, if you're admitted and on the roll and employed in connection with providing legal services by anyone authorised under the Act, you'll be taken as acting as a solicitor. But that's the position now, so not something that our proposals would, ch would change in any way. Thank you, Julia. And perhaps we'll move on from hats to firms now. Um, and i come to you perhaps on this one, Tony. So, so what happens with firms that are currently authorised by Silex? But how many firms are in that boat? Well, Tony, I think you might be on mute because I can't hear you. We did well to get through 20 I minutes. I was indeed. We got, this, we got yeah, this far. Bigger. Sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> That's all right. So, as I was saying, there are around uh, 20 Silex firms that operate in, in the various areas um, for which Silex lawyers are, are authorised. And then there's a slightly separate boat of around 40 um, firms that are the so-called Silex ACCA probate entities, which basically do probate work um, that's closely related to accountancy practices that are regulated by the ACCA. So we're going to take a slightly different approach to those two sets of firms. Um, for the Silex firms, it's a fairly straightforward uh, approach in principle. So we're going to um, reauthorise them as firms that are regulated by the SRA. And for some, that's pretty straightforward because they can already be authorised under SRA rules, either because um, the people who own and manage the firm currently include a solicitor or because they include someone who is not an authorised person under the Legal Services Act. Um, so those are fine. Those don't need any change to our rules. But most of the Silex firms are currently owned and managed only by people who are authorised Silex lawyers. So we're proposing to change our authorisation rules, which in a way that would allow us to uh, bring those firms into SRA regulation. Um, the treatment or the, the proposed approach to the Silex ACCA firms is different. Um, they currently have a completely separate rule book under Silex regulation. And that reflects the fact that the accountancy practice they're linked to is regulated by the ACCA. So, for instance, they don't handle client money uh, and our proposed approach is, is pretty much to mirror that. So we would have uh, very much the same set of rules that would continue to apply to the ACCA practices. Uh, and we're talking to the ACCA about the implications of that as part of this consultation. OK, excellent. So let's move um, on to our um, a second key area um, in the consultation, and that is education authorisation. Now, Juliet said earlier that the proposals here is to mirror the current approach. Tony, I'll, I'll come to you to sort of, I presume you agree with Juliet, or are you going to disagree with disagree with her? But is it, is that right, the mirroring of the approach? That's absolutely right in terms of the, the approach in principle. Um, so nothing really to add to what Juliet said. We just wanted to highlight a couple of practical areas where there will be differences. Uh, from the way in which we understand Silex regulation currently operate authorisation um, and those are really just mechanical differences and they're all set out in our consultation paper. So the first one is around decision making. Um, at the moment we use trained SRA staff and independent adjudicators to take authorisation decisions about solicitors and SRA firms and we're proposing to use the same approach for authorisation decisions about Silex members. Again that's one of the potential synergies that were mentioned earlier. Uh, but we do recognise that we will need to involve external advisors at times to uh, to make sure that we have the right expertise to inform those decisions. Um, the second main distinction is around appeal rights, and, and it's really more a distinction about our, our sort of intended future approach. So at the moment, unlike solicitors, Silex members don't have a legal right to appeal authorisation decisions to an external body. Um, but we think it would be good if they could. So we're proposing to work with Silex and others to um, 
work towards a change in the law that we'd need to enable that. But as an interim measure, we, we don't expect to be able to arrange that in time uh, for the proposed uh, redelegation of, of regulation. So we're planning to provide an internal appeal process, um, which we think is similar to, to the way in which we understand Silex regulation currently deals with appeals about its authorization decisions. And then the third and final practical difference we wanted to highlight is around continuing competence for Silex lawyers. So Silex regulation currently undertakes annual audits of the CPD records of Silex members. Uh, we've said that we won't do that as a routine matter. What we're planning to do is to evolve our current action plan for the continuing competence of solicitors to make sure that it also reflects the needs of authorised Silex lawyers. Uh, and what that action plan does is set out how we set competence standards and how we take decisions on regulatory action where necessary to improve competence in particular areas. Um, but Silex will continue to audit the CPD records of its members and it's said that it will report to us um, if, it, if it identifies any non-compliance that we ought to be aware of. Thanks, Tony. We've had a couple of questions actually come in on the education um, theme, which is um, along the lines of well, what an impact will these proposals have if a Silex member wants to cross qualify as a solicitor? Uh, can you answer that one, Tony? Uh, yes, the short answer is, is that our proposals that we're consulting on won't really affect the cross qualification routes. Uh, so Silex members will be able to continue to use the transitional legal practice course route to qualify as a solicitor and that's available until 2032 or alternatively they can apply to us for exemptions from our SQE assessments on an individual basis and we have um, plenty of information on our website about both of those options which won't change as a result of our proposals. Thanks Tony and also thank you um, to um, those who sent that question in. Um, the third key theme um, you highlighted, Juliet, was um, investigation um, and enfor enforcement. So do you want to summarise what, what are the key takeaways there? Yes, thank you. So um, this is one of the areas where we can make things more joined up for, for those um, members um, who already work in SRA firms, as I mentioned earlier. Um, just um, as a starting point, um, as I as I highlighted uh, uh, earlier, we propose to adopt the full suite of enforcement powers, um, bringing together those currently used by Silex regulation for Silex members um, and firms, which include specifically, for example, interim suspension, and those we use for solicitors and SRA firms, which include um, specifically, for example, um, fixed fines. Um, the, the consultation um, has a draft um, annex about um, sanctions and controls for authorised Silex lawyers, so it sets, sets that all out and explains um, how we would approach using them, so the kind of um, factors and triggers that would um, indicate one sanction or another. So worth having a look at that. Um, where there's a serious concern about an authorised Silex lawyer, um, we um, would take this forward um, under the Silex code, um, reflecting the need to um, take action in relation to their status as an individual um, authorised and regulated by us. Um, where the same standards apply, for example, under the SRA firm code, um, the individual standards would be the, the, the primary we, we, we'd adopt, the primary um, code we'd be pointing to. Um, and there won't be double jeopardy. Um, we won't be, you know, for example, um, imposing two fines for the same issue under two separate codes if, if, if both of them apply, just to be really clear. Um, what we would always do, though, is consider um, whether we would need to use our existing SRA powers instead or in combination, for example, where we've um, got powers, powers to control an individual's practice, for example, to restrict a person's ability to work in um, or with a solicitor's practice or to hold management or compliance roles within a firm. Those are the kinds of things that we'd look at um, in, 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 in kind of combination with a, a disciplinary sanction like a, a rebuke or a fine. Um, the consultation also explains our um, proposed approach to investigating and taking disciplinary decisions. Um, as with authorization, there'll be some practical differences from the current system. So, for example, um, in most cases, we use individual adjudicators for certain decisions, such as issuing rebukes or fines. Um, we would um, hold panel hearings where necessary, um, and we'd expect to use them where the outcome is likely to be a suspension or a strike off. Um, and we also want to make sure that there are statutory rights to an external appeal, 
consistent with those um, that solicitors have. Um, and Tony touched on this in relation to authorization decisions. It's it, uh, the same applies here, which is um, we'd like there to be those rights of appeal, but um, that would need a law change. So um, in the meantime, we would provide an internal appeal route. Um, um, and finally, just to mention, the consultation also explains our approach to publishing disciplinary decisions um, and also to, to costs, to costs of investigation and, and, and action that we take. Um, and we think our approach to both is broadly similar to, to, to that of Silex regulation. Um, and as I say, set, set out more detail in the consultation, but um, no um, material changes there. Thank you. And we just touched upon education. Actually, somebody sent in a question around continuing competence, which I think, Tony, you covered off that Silex will be continuing to audit that. So perhaps I'll come to you with this question, uh, Linda. Um, thank you for who um, submitted this. It said, would Silex lawyers have to continue to complete an online form at year end regarding CPD, um, which isn't necessarily the same for solicitors at the moment? What's the answer to that, Linda? Yes, absolutely. So um, currently, and this will continue, Silex members record their CPD in an online portfolio. Um, that arrangement will continue. It's through that process that will allow Silex to continue to audit the portfolios. And obviously, that's the process by which any non-compliance would be re reported through to the SRA as the regulator. Thank you, um, Linda. Now, we, we covered off those key areas. Um, in the consultation, but I think there was a couple of others that might be worth touching upon. And I suppose the first is the sort of proposed arrangements around client protection. Now, I know part of the argument, and I think you mentioned this in the opening, Juliet, was it would bring more consistent levels of protection. Uh, what, what does that actually involve? And Tony, perhaps I'll come to you for the detail on that. Yeah, thanks, Ben. That really just flows from the basic principle we've talked about that we're proposing to reauthorise Silex firms as SRA regulated firms, which means that generally our rules would then apply to those firms and that would include broadly the same client protection requirements. Um, so just to highlight a couple of the key things um, that that implies for consumers, one is around professional indemnity insurance, where broadly our minimum terms and conditions are fairly similar to the current Silex regulation requirements. Um, but there is one important difference for incorporated firms, which I think is most of the Silex firms, that their um, minimum PII coverage per claim would, would need to be £3 million pounds rather than £2 million. Pounds. So that's clearly a good thing for consumers if they have a very large claim, uh, which is, I think is fairly unusual. Um, it potentially has some implications for firms and we're um, raising that as part of the consultation. We're also talking to the, uh, the insurers that work in this market just to check there aren't any issues or unintended consequences um, with PII. Um, but another possibly bigger um, benefit for consumers is that where we can reauthorise a Silex firm uh, under our current rules, then that means the clients of the firms would, if necessary, be able to make a claim to the SRA's compensation fund. And that's quite an important improvement because the, the terms of our fund are quite a bit wider than the current Silex arrangements in terms of the work they cover and also the, the protection they offer. Um, but we do need to flag that we don't yet have the legal power to provide that access to clients of the group of Silex firms that are owned and run entirely by Silex authorised lawyers. Um, so yet again, we would need to work with Silex and, and with others to get a law change to enable that. Uh, and again, that is likely to take longer than we would like. So I think Silex have indicated that they would continue to underwrite the current arrangements for that group of firms. But those are the key um, benefits that we see coming out in terms of client protection. And we also touched a bit on consumer information um, early on. What, so, yeah. How will the rules apply there in terms of what's needed to be published for consumers? Yeah, so as, as Juliet said earlier, basically the rules uh, that we have on consumer information would then read across to Silex entities. Um, again, not to the Silex ACCA entities because they have their own separate rule book, but our rules would apply to the Silex firms that are operating in, uh, in a wider range of areas. And essentially that would mean that when consumers look at a firm, then they should expect to see the same information or comparable information about services and prices and complaints and regulatory status. Um, whether the firm they're looking at is, is one that's run by solicitors or by authorised Silex lawyers. Um, so again, that simplifies things for consumers. It will obviously mean some changes for Silex firms to come into compliance, but um, we would support them with that. OK, um, we've already covered off a few um, questions, but I suppose before we get on to some further um, questions, um, is there anything else, Juliet, you wanted to highlight that we haven't covered? 
I'm just uh, I'm just going to uh, underpin what Tony said about the um, client protection arrangements and and you know the fact that we're kind of keen to to, to get this um, this change to legislation and and critically as as he said that would allow um, uh, those small proportion of, of those firms which are um, wholly owned and managed by um, authorised Silex lawyers to contribute to the fund going forward but for their clients to get the benefit of it and, and, and as we say that we think that's 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 a really important change that we want to pursue. I think um, the only other thing I would say is the consultation's got more detail on everything we talked about um, and it gives contact details if people want to talk to us direct. I think there are some under the under the the the, the webinar as well, um, Ben. I think you were saying earlier. Um, so do please get in touch. It also flags some other detailed issues, including how we'd approach um, transitional arrangements if if the redelegation of regulation um, uh, was to go ahead. Um, it invites views on our draft impact assessments about the proposals, a, re a regulatory impact assessment, and um, an equality, diversity, and inclusion assessment. Um, so we really want to hear from everyone um, with an interest, um, and um, of course, um, particularly from Silex members and firms, uh, uh, your your views. Um, so that was all I, I wanted to, to to really add um, uh, before uh, before picking up on the on the questions. Yeah, and we've we've had quite a lot of questions. Apologise again, the lights have gone out, so you now see half my face. But many would argue that's an improvement. So let's move on to the first um, question, which is sort of an obvious question: is what if this happens? What what, what would the timing um, of of that be? Um, Juliet, did you want to answer that one um, first, and Linda, do come in if um, if you want to. Um. Sure. So. Um... Uh, well, I mean, the first, I think the first staging post, um, you know, Linda, is is um, the decision of of, of your organisation whether it wishes to redelegate its regulatory functions to the SRA. Um, so um, there's, there would be that decision, and 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 our board would need to decide to proceed with the proposals um, coming out of the consultation, looking at the the feedback, um, of course. So. Um, if those decisions are taken to go forward, then um, both we and Silex will need to seek approval for the necessary rule changes um, from the Legal Services Board, um, and they would need to take a decision as to whether to approve that. So we've said that actually bearing in mind um, those steps that need to be taken, um, we don't expect to be in a position to take on um, uh, the, the, the new functions of regulatory arrangements until um, the end of summer next year at the earliest, um, uh, because we'd need to be looking at um, you know the timelines for getting the approvals in place and then for, for for implementation after that and linda i presume you agree agree with that and that that key point isn't it is sort of your decision absolutely so um, our consultation closes on the, the 5th of november we've uh, a board meeting scheduled for the end of november and, and that's the the board meeting that will look at the outcomes of our consultation so at that point we will have a clear idea as to whether we wish to um, redelegate uh, and then we will need to um, invite a response again from um, the sra if we're in that situation as to the outcomes of, of, of its consultation and whether it's uh, still willing to uh, to undertake that delegation and if that's the case, as Juliet says, we will then go through the application process, which you know is a, is a process that takes several months. Um, there are two dependencies from our side. We uh, we have to uh, make an application to amend part of our charter, and we have to apply to the Legal Services Board for the change in delegation. So. Um, as Juliet said, we are looking at, at well into 2024 for any changes. And as part of that, we would need to look at a transitional arrangement um, uh, and a handover from uh, Silex regulation to the SRA, if that's what happens. And we would want to do that in a very clean way, uh, where cases, for example, are completed under one regulatory regime and are not crossing between them. So uh, there's a whole piece of work to do to, to keep that as simple as possible and also to look at things like the setting of fees, etc. Thank you. And well, perhaps you've mentioned fees there and we've had sort of a, a, a bunch of question about um, fees, which is probably sort of worth grouping together because yeah, I suppose, yeah, Juliet, what what is the approach to fees? How, how will that work? Yes, well, as Linda said um, at the at the outset, really, one of the key kind of key principles is is, is no cross subsidy between um, the the the, um, the 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 fees and the funding for the regulation for for, for both um, professions. So we uh, we'd um, you know propose to um, engage in a in a, a separate fee setting uh, and fee collection process um, for Silex members. 
Um, we'd want to be really clear and transparent about um, the cost of regulation in that respect to so have separate uh, financial reporting um, and, and, and kind of accounting arrangements as well. In terms of modelling the fees, um, there's, there's, there's work to be done in order to, 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 to kind of set you know, detailed arrangements and discussions to be had around that. I think what we have said, though, is that, you know, we don't anticipate there, be, um, there being any um, increase on the fee, fee levels at the moment um, that, are, that are charged at the moment, but actually also that there are lots of opportunities for cost savings. Um, so we think that the position in that respect looks really positive, but there's work to be done in terms of um, looking through the detail um, there. Thanks, Juliet. And um Tony, I'll perhaps come to you on this next question, and this is around, um, we've had a question come in in terms of um, carrying out reserved activities. How will this affect members? Will the Act be amended, that's the Legal Services Act, amended to reflect this change in regulation? And will this allow further rights for legal executives or will only those with advanced practice rights? Thanks, Ben. So we're not proposing changes to the Legal Services Act. That's sort of beyond our gift. Uh, it, obviously, something that, that people talk about from time to time. So essentially, the changes that we're proposing are to you know, maintain the existing uh, practicing rights available to Silex members, but to bring them into our regulation uh, and under the sort of consistent set of standards that we've already talked about. OK, excellent. Um, we've got another question here, which is around regulation of firms. Um, this person asks, I, I own a firm regulated by Silex regulation. Will my firm be automatically transferred um, from Silex regulation to the SRA? Um, if Obviously, if these proposals go ahead. And if so, what will the procedures be? And, and will there be any additional um, costs? Tony, did you want to come in on that one again? Yeah, um, the short answer is yes, it will be um, broadly automatic. We'll obviously work with firms and, and it's a relatively small cohort of firms by the standards of those we already work with um, to make sure they understand what the process is and that they're sort of um, happy with it. And we're not proposing any sort of special additional cost for the transfer of regulation to the SRA. There, there is clearly the ongoing sort of um, fee structure that's in place, um, but, but nothing extra. And if Julia. I might just add, oh, yeah, I just wanted to add add something something on that is we've also said that there'll also be a sort of passporting over of um, managers and compliance managers who'd be um, automatically registered as the, the as the culp or coffer um, unless a firm wants to do something different or seeks an alternative that would automatically be um, be passported over as well. Um, so those individuals would be approved as those role hol holders under our firm regime. And um, thank you, Juliet. We've got another firm question. On perhaps I'll come back to you again on this one is um, this person asks I have another director with the with the firm who is a solicitor how will my firm be regulated by the SRA uh, they, they assume the requirement will not be by way of um, an ABS an alternative business structure but they wanted confirmation on that that's right so when the owners and managers of a firm include a solicitor and 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 you know the rest are um Silex lawyers, um, the firm will be authorised as an SRA recognised body under our current rules. So that, that, that using the, the sort of recognised body um, sort of legislation, um, it's where owners and managers include someone who's not authorised to provide reserved legal services um, uh, at all, that the firm will be authorised as a life body um, like the other um, ABSs we regulate, the other alternative business structures we regulate. So can, can I come in on that, Ben? So yeah, sure. I, I, I think it's helpful to understand that essentially in the proposed model, there's there's three categories now. So there's the continuation of the two types of, of structure that, that Juliet's just referred to. And the proposal on the table is to essentially create a third category. And they are the ones who are wholly um, Silex led. And, and that's where the changes uh, in the framework are proposed. Thank you. And Tony, perhaps I'll come to you on it's another firm related um, question and you touched upon this earlier that effectively there would be increased protection in terms of the PII, the uh, in indemnity insurance arrangements. Um, this person's asked, yeah, will, will this affect my firm's PII? Will, will I need to sort of get new PII? Um, it, yes, as, as I mentioned earlier, it, it will mean that um, firms will need PII that conforms with our minimum terms and conditions. And it would have to be obtained from one of our participating insurers. Um, I think that basically the, the insurers that currently provide cover for Silex firms are very much aligned with the list of insurers that work with us. So we're not anticipating any major difficulty with that. But as I, I mentioned, we are talking to the participating insurers at the moment, as well as inviting views directly from firms through the consultation. 
OK, um, well, I think we uh, I'm just looking through to see whether there's um, more questions, but um, I think we've got through a lot of the questions um, there. Thank you um, for um, Linda, Tony, Juliet for um, running through all of those. Um, I can't see any more um, um, questions. Um, there is a few questions. Actually, I'll just add one, but it might be. Um, I don't know whether Juliet, there's much you can add on it. We've had quite a few questions in around will Silex lawyers still have to pay additionally for the, the types of courts they practice in? I don't know whether that Juliet or Linda, you have an answer on that one. Uh, I, can, I can certainly start there. I mean, I, I think what's proposed is that the um, the same ability to apply for practice rights as exists now um, is transitioned across. So um, for Silex members whose job roles mean that they need more than one sets of rights, they will need they will still need to do that. I think there's um, a consideration for the SRA that will be part of its fee setting process um, as to how it administers the application of those where um, people apply for multiple rights rather than just one set of rights. So, for example, litigation rights in criminal and civil or family, for example. So um, that's part of the fee setting process that Juliet referred to earlier. Thank you, Linda. Well, I think we'll wind it up there. Thank you to everyone um, who asked the, um, a question. Hopefully um, that run through has helped you understand our proposals. But as I've said, please do have a look at the consultation, the links below. And then please do let us know what you think. And actually, there's contact details in there. If you want to have a further conversation, you've got further questions, you want to yeah, give us live feedback or discuss this, do get in touch with us because actually, um, as I said, we need to, um, we, the, we don't know what the outcome of this will be and we want it to be based upon the best available evidence possible in terms of um, where we head on this. But otherwise, I just wanted to say a huge thank you for everyone who's joining us. A huge thank you um, to all our speakers and no thank you to the light in my room, which kept on going off. But otherwise, I hope everyone has a lovely afternoon.